You are listening to The Addiction Files, where we discuss evidence-based treatment, clinical pearls and resources, while striving to destigmatize the treatment of addiction in our medical culture and save lives. We are the addiction doctors, Dr. Darlene Peterson and Paula Cook. Welcome to The Addiction Files. We are back and we have our guest, Dr. Steve Sugden, joining us to discuss strengthening neuroplasticity and substance use recovery. And we are so excited to talk about this tonight. Dr. Paula Cook is going to introduce him and then we will get started. Okay, so Steve Sugden earned his medical degree at University of Utah School of Medicine and completed a psychiatry residency program at the University of California, Davis in Sacramento, California. He completed an MPH at University of California, Berkeley, and an MSS at U.S. Army War College. Dr. Sugden is board certified in psychiatry by the ABPN, addiction medicine by the ABPM, disaster medicine by APPS, and lifestyle medicine by the ABLM, and he is a colonel in the U.S. Army Reserves. Wow. Well, you're pretty qualified there, Steve. So we're very grateful to have you and we're honored to have you on the podcast. And I heard you give this lecture at the ACLM conference in October, I think it was, and it was so excellent. We invited you to come and share the content of the talk uh, because I thought it was so meaningful and it was so well received in that setting. So we wanted to talk about this interesting topic of neuroplasticity. Seems to be a bit of a catchphrase these days. And uh, so, yeah, just... Tell us a little bit more about what this means in psychiatry and substance use uh, treatment and how lifestyle medicine plays a role. Thank you very much for this opportunity. A huge fan of both of yours, um, having worked with Dr. Cook, you for several years in the past. And um, and this is a great podcast that you guys provide and a service for the community. Um, so lifestyle medicine, let, let's start with this for a few moments. Um, lifestyle medicine is based upon the idea that many of our chronic disorders have a common pathway. And, and so this might be, there's an inflammatory pathway and secondary to the inflammatory pathway, this might lead to diet type two diabetes. It might lead to heart problems. It may need, lead to some of the neurocognitive problems. And if we go back and address the signs of inflammation, then we can have improvement and we, we can actually have reversal of this disease. And so what we find out lifestyle is based upon changing behaviors and it, it's centered on eating healthier, trying to have you know more of a, a plant-based diet with less ultra processed foods, it's trying to exercise more. It's trying to improve our sleep. It's trying to have means where we have healthy means of, of decreasing our stress. Um, it's trying to have healthy relationships. And it's then also trying to avoid um, unhealthy substances. When we look at substance use disorders, you know, substance use disorders, uh, as well as mental health disorders, these are also chronic medical conditions. And we, when we look at what would be the common pathway, we also find this idea of neuroinflammation. We find you know, neuroendocrine pathways. We find a lot of these processes that are involved with these same disorders. And the lifestyle psychiatry movement is really trying to apply these same types of you know, lifestyle principles, but then also looking at, you know, what like psychiatrists do well is trying to look at reasons people are reluctant to make changes and pr- provide some of that behavioral um, modification plans or modification and, and, and help people try to make some of these uh, ongoing changes. When we, when we look at, you know, substance use, you know, nobody who listens to this podcast should be, uh, you know, alarmed to hear that we aren't doing well with this, um, with, with, with the opioid ep- epidemic that we're in. And I think they're saying we're in the, in the fourth wave of this ep- 
epidemic, you know, with fentanyl, with high, high xylazine, with methamphetamines, with alcohol. And, and, you know, the death rates prior to the pandemic was we had about a, a million deaths that were involved from overdose deaths. Um, we don't have recent data for the past three years, but we do have some good um, data from a Kaiser family um, survey showing that through the pandemic, all three of these agents have been worse. And when we finally get the, the those data, most experts expect that we're going to be well over into the million and a half range of people that have died from overdose from, from the substance use. And so we need to try to do something. And, and, and instead of just trying to treat this as a, an acute illness, the lifestyle approach with the lifestyle psychiatry, lifestyle medicine approach is let's look at this as a chronic approach. And it's really interesting that if we look at it as a chronic approach and start thinking about the neuroplasticity that's involved in change, you know, the lifestyle really has better benefits of trying to reverse some of the, the neuroplastic changes that all of these substances do within the brain. That's so interesting. And I mean, we don't, I don't think any of us classically think of substance use disorder or the reward pathway as being a pathway of neuroinflammation. And I don't know if this is a relatively new concept or maybe we just haven't been taught about it. And I think we were actually talking about this Darlene with Dr. Ballister, right, in terms of bipolar disorder, that there's inflammation in the brain when people are manic. But can you tell us a little bit more about, about neuroinflammation in general and what causes neuroinflammation uh, so that we can kind of move forward and make the argument for why uh, this particular approach may be helpful for people with substance use disorder? No, absolutely. Uh, so inflammation would be any type, you know, like if I have some type of an infection and I bring in my immune system in it, we call it, we have some type of form of inflammation. We also have inflammation when we have an alteration of chemicals within our brain that's causing some type of distress. So we, you know, obviously the, the prime example of this would be cortisol when we have the acute cortisol release from stress. It's interesting also that within the microglia and the astrocytes, there are receptors that respond to high levels of dopamine. And so when those, when they're activated by the dopamine, we have, in, we, we trigger that immune response within the brain. And we just bring in all of those other immune receptors, the IL-6 and the IL-10s and the macrophages. And then that's really what the, they're thinking is, could be then responsible for the alterations that we see within those classic samples within the dopamine systems, why we develop the salience, why we have those types of processes that then are, are so hard to reverse with, within somebody who has developed a substance use disorder. Yeah, so it's kind of a state of chronic inflammation then is what you're saying. It's just a chronic yeah. adaptation, yeah. chronic yeah. inflammation, like we see in other uh, chronic inflammation states. Exactly, exactly. And the data is starting to to, sh to show that is the one more unfortunate side effect that comes from all of the dopamine surges that we, we see with the substance use. That's fascinating. So and what have so previously we've kind of addressed this. We all know this. This is why we're interested in addiction medicine, but we've had all these approaches to treating people with substance use that haven't worked, right? Right. And and this is me saying this, this isn't to say that the medications we we use aren't effective because when you look at the numbers to treat, there probably isn't a medication that's been more effective in treating opioids than buprenorphine. It has a, it has, you know, a number to treat of two. You're not going to get better than that. Unfortunately, people take the buprenorphine and they kind of look at it as then that's the answer. You know, and, and many are able to to make changes within their lifestyles and make changes in their lives. But there's also a large amount of people that just take that and then try to live their same lifestyle, thinking that they're going to receive that, you know, automatic protection from the buprenorphine or from said medication. And it that's not panning out. And and, and people then return to use and and then it becomes harder the next time to try to stabilize people and it becomes harder the sub subsequent time and the subsequent time 
And I, and this is really where the lifestyle changes can be a very good alternative, or I shouldn't say an alternative, but an adaptation to be used in conjunction with. So Steve, why do you think we're seeing this like effect when you're saying we see this over and over when we're just using the medication without these lifestyle changes? Because I don't know that we're addressing the core issues of why, why people oftentimes use. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I'm not, I am far from trying to make this simplistic because, you know, I, I use the analogy of, of the iceberg. You know, so many of us see the top of that iceberg and we, we, we come to very quick decisions of what that is. And we don't look underneath the water and we don't see all of the the, the trauma that this individual has had or the years of depression or the years of all of these other contributing factors and the, the escape that they've been able to find from the substance use. Um, why do why does lifestyle help? I, I think many times it, it helps because it, it provides additional resources for an individual to reverse a lot of these neuroinflammation types of processes that buprenorphine does not offer, that your regular antidepressants or whatever the other medications we might use to try to stabilize a brain. Awesome. So tell us, what's the data? Like, what is the research behind these principles of lifestyle medicine? I think, you know, the six platforms of lifestyle medicine. What do we know in regards to treatment for a substance use disorder? So, so the, I mean, the one that people talk about the most is exercise and, and trying to eat, to try to exercise more. Um, I think all of us have have talked about exercise and and, and probably have had some benefits with exercise. Um, the initial results, you know, probably in the 2015, they started having some of meta analysis, and um, the, the the results have been mixed because they've shown that yes, it helps, but then other meta analysis showed that no, it hasn't helped. Definitively, exercise has been able to show that it helps underlying depression. It also has been able to show that it helps with underlying anxiety. And two of these have been, you know, are core incidences or features of why people have, you know, use substances. The other thing that exercise has been able to show is it decreases this neuroinflammation response. Um, a lot of our immune, this neuro, this response is stored within adipose tissue. As people exercise and decrease adipose tissue, then they have a decreased neuroinflammation response. Um, There's some interesting issues, some interesting things that also that it does. There is a part in the brain called the raphinuclei, which is where we store serotonin. Serotonin is a potent marker for um, uh, for, um, neuroplasticity. And, and that's something that can actually help reverse or uh, attune or mend some of these dopamine pathways. We also find that when we have exercise, we can have increased release of BDNF, which is also a, a growth factor, which can then you, you have two potent releases of, of factors that can help um, change or uh, modulate some of those factors. A, and then you also have decrease of this neuroinflammation factors. So the exercise by itself has three things that it's helping to do to promote healthier growth within the brain. One of the areas that I think is is exciting, but is it's also very hard. Um, most of our individual, most of our patients who use substances, you know, essentially live in a food desert or they have food scarcity. Um, the amount of food content that they have we know is not good. You know, those who have, those, you know, there's such a high correlation with Warnicke encephalopathy with regards to people who have alcohol use disorder because they, they aren't getting their vitamin Bs because they aren't eating cream food. Um, and we have such a high correlation uh, of, of, of challenges with that. In addition to that, we know that they don't have, most of them don't have good minerals or, you know, a lot of the vitamins in addition to that. And when they do have food, the majority of them are consuming ultra processed foods. We can talk about ultra processed foods later, but all of these factors also reinforce this inflammation. And the fact if we can help individuals just develop healthier eating patterns, they can have so much more improvement of that. 
there's also something that's really fascinating is um, we're starting to learn more about what's called the brain gut microbiota connection. And so if we have, well, people who have substance use disorders have a higher likelihood of developing dysbiosis. And so dysbiosis is when we have an unhealthy pattern of bacteria within our gut. Why this is important is because tryptophan is the only amino acid that we have to get through our, our diet. But we can have all the tryptophan we want, but if we don't have the healthy um, bacteria within our gut, we can't absorb tryptophan. And tryptophan is needed to be able to convert or, or process serotonin, which is the same process that we we're talking about of that is so viable or, or, or needed within you know, kind of developing this healthy brain chemistry. So if we are just getting our food from ultra processed foods, if we're getting our food or living, having food scarcity, we're not having the, the, the needed microbiota within our guts to be able to process tryptophan, get tryptophan, and and be healthy. So that's I think those are the two that show some of the the most exciting d- data that's out there. Yeah, it's so fascinating, and it it makes so much sense in terms of fueling and what how much energy the brain takes and what we feed it with in terms of the kind of output we get. Um, I've been really humbled by trying to you know counsel educate patients on healthier eating making assumptions that they have access to even things like a stove or a fridge or a hot plate. And I'm here thinking I'm so smart by saying, well, beans are so cheap. Why don't you just eat beans? And they're like, doc, I don't have a stove or a hot plate. You know, so you have to think, I've had to really learn how to think back even a few steps of how do we even get these healthy foods cooked and prepared for people. But yeah, it's a really good challenge, and it's it's something that's in, in the for should be in the forefront of of keeping our people, you know, much healthier than we can by just prescribing the medication. And, and I, I know you you and Dr. De La Garcia have done some work at Odyssey House where you were trying to have um, food kind of these kitchen groups or, or or cooking groups, and 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 there's just been some incredible data with just. That that's one of the most effective forms of group therapy is just teaching people how to cook and giving them those insights with cooking to give them skills because, you know, home ec really isn't being taught anymore in our middle schools, which is which is shocking. And and they don't have these abilities to do the cooking. And and and, and it, it's really a great form of of therapy it is just how, teaching people how to cook and having that common common eating experience. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, if we're eating healthier, if we're moving better, we actually sleep more, which leads to the third point. The third stage is sleep. Um, for those who who aren't seeing this, um, everybody's smiling as soon as I start mm-hmm. talking about sleep, because within adolescents, um, there's it's been estimated up to about thirty one percent of people of adolescents who have a substance use disorder also have a sleeping disorder, and adults it's estimated as high as ninety five percent of individuals with a substance use disorder have a sleep disorder. So ninety five percent, I mean. That's pretty much ubiquitous. ubiquitous. I mean, do you guys well, see? And, and that's the most common complaint that we have patients in early, and particularly early recovery is the sleep. Right. Right. And, and we know, and my experience is the number one predictor of why somebody's going to re- return back to use is because their sleep's off. And, and so how do we improve sleep? You know, so... Fortunately, exercise is something that can help improve sleep. If we can work on improving um, the way that people have with stress, that can help them in sleep. And then this is, you know, when we talk about stress, homelessness is, you know, a, a huge stress. You know, this is one of those areas that I think we need to do. You know, it'd be nice if we could do more, if being able to make sure that we can provide people a safe place to sleep because their brains need it to be able to help have this restorative process. 
because we know, especially in that early recovery, that that is so prone to where people return back to use. Yeah, that's such a good point. I I have a patient. He's one of my favorite patients. He he lived ho- with homelessness for like something like thirty seven years, and now he's housed and he's abstinent from risky substances, and he's doing very well. He's a veteran, actually. is He's a really amazing person. He's a musician and an artist, but. He or he tells me all these stories every time we have a visit. It's more just about storytelling. And he tells me what it was like to live um, as a person experiencing homelessness for that many years. And it's all about that exact thing. You always have to be watching your back, watching your belongings, watching out for violence. And you never sleep well. I said he didn't sleep well. And then that leads to patterns of continued substance use as a way of survival, really. And he said it's even taken him a long time now that he's housed to learn to sleep at night, just to get away from that kind of hypervigilance and that patterning. I mean, that's, this is an extreme example, but I think it, it, it's true for a lot of people. And that's, I love that you bring up that point. But I I think even people who are housed still struggle with that sleep. And, and, you know, I don't, I'm not planning to talk about this, but, you know, we all have these electronic devices in our pockets which as soon as I, I struggle with sleep, I, I pull up this, or, or many people pull up this electronic device where they fall asleep to watching television or, or some type of form of distraction. And it doesn't improve sleep. It just kind of keeps us in that superficial um, state of, of sleep that we're not getting the good REM, st- REM sleep or restorative sleep. And then we, then we struggle with having enough of that cognitive power the next day just to be able to have the energy to do the things that we need to do. How do you counsel your patients? Because as they come off some of their other substances, then we'll see them, especially these energy drinks, four and five and seven a day. Almost every time they're coming to see me, they've got their monster or something with them. And and of course, we know that's also another thing disrupting their sleep. Like, what what's your counsel for them on that? So I mean, it's all about the little gains, and then and it's like yeah. if they're going to be using the caffeine, you know, that's yeah. I, again, that's where motivational interviewing comes in, and trying to find out what it is they're willing, you know, they're, to assess their willingness to try to change something, mm-hmm. and can we first make changes to where we have no monster drinks, you know, after six o'clock. Then maybe after four o'clock and then can we change it from seven to four, you know, seven to five, you know, all things that, you know, just trying to gradually change that. But in the, in the process of us saying we're taking away things, what are things that we can then help add to that? So can we add into some stretching exercises? Can we, can we add into a meditation practice can we add it into a a in the, in the evening like a a gratitude journaling where they they journal about one thing that they were grateful for about the day and 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 try to use some of these natural you know endorphins natural oxy, oxytocin natural things like this that are going to help you know the brain have restorative changes versus just trying to replace it with more of this stimulated, caffeinated, functioning thing that which doesn't work. Yeah. Um, step four, I think this kind of goes hand in hand with a lot of these other things that we're talking about. Is how do we stress less? And I, I, and, and this is really kind of like the heart of what we were, you know, the whole, the whole introduction of this. Um, nor the the pathway that we're talking about is the stress, the chronic stress leads to the chronic cortisol. And when you have the chronic cortisol, everything is worse. It makes addictions worse. It makes sleep worse. It makes all of those interactions worse. Um, People struggle with chronic stress. Um, And I I wish that there was a, a simple, fast remedy and there isn't, um, and it's that willingness is somebody willing to try to engage in a, a healthier pattern because, for example, if we work on mindfulness 
And, you know, there, there's, there's some, there's some great studies to show how mindfulness is one of the few things that it can actually help get a brain to process long-term thinking versus when we're caught in the substance use, one can't think long-term. It's all about the immediacy, the now, they can't have that long-term process. You've probably had the same conversation when I say mindfulness to patients, they'll say, doc, you don't understand. I can't even think more than two minutes. And then it's <laughs> like, okay, then let's try to do some deep breathing exercises for 30 seconds. And let's, if we can do 30 seconds, maybe we can get up to 60 seconds. And it's just that routine practice of trying to do something different. You touch on a really important point, though, to bring up is set just imperceptibly small goals. Like is if they feel like this is something that I can't do and they just have that defeatism attitude is all right. Let's just start with 30 seconds. And right. Another great meditation is how we eat. Can we yeah. eat great slowly and try to actually taste whatever flavor of something we put in our mouth you know and we're three physicians and we've probably have some of the worst eating habits because it's always about how fast how fast how fast because we've got to get on to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing um and it, it's really just trying to slow this down so we can actually enjoy the taste and and that can be a very effective form of meditation is just mindfully eat that's great advice and so the, the great thing about this is we talk about our limbic system which is really what gets hijacked by the dopamine use and working on some of these metacognitive processes like meditation like mindfulness actually works on the cortex of our brain and works down and that's why it's been shown to be so effective is because it, it comes from a different approach it's it's not trying to rewire the limbic system from the limbic process, but it's trying to come from a top-down approach. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And I think I love how you give lots of options because I think if we just give people one option or if they have one option for themselves, like breathing or meditation, it, when you're in a state of you know distress, it's hard to reach. It's maybe difficult to just have that one tool. Different situations may require different tools. And so I like to do deep breathing exercises with, with patients when they've never had that experience. It's like, let's do some box breathing or let's see what it would be like to just walk down this hallway and just try to feel every time you put the foot down on the ground, what does that feel like for you? And, and because I think some of these concepts have this existential surrounding by it that only somebody who goes to, who lives in, in Thailand or Tibet or in a monastery can practice these things. And, and, and they don't realize that human beings, normal human beings can actually get a lot of benefit from this. I really love that you do it with your patient because it's like you said, some people, they just hear it, but don't really understand what simple things what a simple movement and just a simple practice that it is, how approachable, reachable it is. So that kind of leads, takes us to step five, or, I mean, you could, these are all principles yeah. that you can kind of yeah. put in whatever, which is increased socialization or our, our, the U S surgeon general recently came out with his epidemic, his epidemic on loneliness. And he quoted some literature that was cited from a, a BYU researcher that was looking at even pre-pandemic, about 50% of Americans were lonely. Right. And, and when you look at the, you know, our population of individuals who have substance use, if 50% of quote unquote normies are lonely, what is, <laughs> what is that? What is that number at? I mean, I don't even want to take a guess. Um, there's some really amazing data that's coming out with what loneliness might look like. So if, if I have loneliness in, you know, you, so one definition of loneliness is we have at least two people in our life, not pets, but people in our life that we have a, a relationship with 
that we have no expectation of. And what that means is, you know, we, we have some relationships in our lives where, you know, if if I if I have if I get my hair cut and I pay somebody to cut my hair, I talk to that person. That's a that's one level of friendship. You know, another level of friendship might be, you know, I, you know, we all have staff that we work with in, in our in our, our facilities, but because we are a provider and in many times, you know, they they look to us as quote unquote the leader. There's kind of like this, I'm kind of the doctor, I'm the leader. And we might have nurses or social workers or other people that look to us for this kind of mentorship that there's still something that's expected in with this relationship. And if they weren't the paid, they wouldn't hang out with us. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) And and, and when we look at how many of these relationships that we have, there's a lot of service type of stuff. And so do we have people in our lives where we hang out with them just because we hang out with them and we don't expect anything or there isn't this transactional part. And and, in some experts have said the loneliness is we have to have at least two people. And if we don't have two people, it's a definition of loneliness. You're like really narrowing it down for me. (laughs) And you got us, Darlene. Here we are. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, when he took out pets, I was like, oh, I'm in trouble. (laughs) Well, and and, and so, you know, at ACLM, when we were talking about this, people were saying, well, I've got my pet. And I'm like, there's still your pet may unconditionally love you, but they still expect that you are doing expect everything. <laughs> so there's still that it, it still is that. Um, that's, that's a great, you're the first person that's defined it that way. And I'm like, that is such a great way to define that. Yeah. So if we are lonely, our sleep is off. We have worse sleep. If we are lonely, we tend to eat worse. And you can, you know, when we talk about all of these other pillars and, and for some people, especially when you talk about the unhoused, there is almost a, once you kind of get into this acceptance of loneliness, there is almost this power that comes from loneliness. And what's really interesting, there's a study where they looked at rats and they looked at different stages of their, their lives of rats. And in one population, they gave them cocaine. And in another population, they just isolated them from everything. And then they looked at their nucleus accumbens, where is kind of like that area of where dopamine is stored. And those populations were the exact same. Wow. That's amazing. So almost like there's almost this once like this, the loneliness almost reinforces this whole addictive pathway and whether it's through, you know, just the, the stress that comes from that. And then they get that from the hyper cortisol levels or, or something, but there, but there's really that loneliness reinforces that our population. If we are lonely, what do we turn to our substances, mm-hmm. our, our substances, but we also turn to our technology, mm-hmm. which further reinforces this loneliness, you know, and we say, well, I'm, I'm, I am connecting with everybody virtually. And, and again, it's, it so many times that virtual connection isn't, doesn't, doesn't give the same benefits as having the in-person contact. And it, it just reinforces this negativeness and it actually reinforces the whole dopamine reward pathway. The six, the sixth, Peer or, or pillar um, is avoiding harmful substances, you know, which it, we could say is all of the substances of choice that we've been talking about. I like to also include here the ultra processed food. It, it's really interesting how when an individual who has the majority of their diets being with the ultra processed foods, how the ultra processed foods actually reinforces this, this neuroimmuno type of response or this hyper um, inflammatory response within the brain. The second thing that's interesting is our brain with like within the nucleus of Cummins has natural opioid receptors because we have things called endorphins. So we have many of these, um, these receptors, you know, mute receptors and these ultra processed foods also work on those same 
mute receptors in the brain. So they also reinforce the brain you know, reward pathway. And, and for years, there's been a lot of talk about these gateway drugs. Is it cannabis? Is it alcohol? Is it nicotine? And there's now growing literature to think to say that really what the what we aren't talking about is one of the most harmful gateway drugs is actually ultra processed foods. Oh, fascinating. People don't like to talk about it, but it's so true. So those are the pillars, and it, it's really you know it's through trying to make some of these lifestyle processes we can improve a lot of this neuroinflammatory response. We can actually then promote the receptors or the growth factors within our brain that can help reverse a lot of the, the dopamine reward pathway pathways, and we can develop alternative pathways in our brain. So it promotes neuroplasticity. And it's really for these reasons why, you know, I feel that this lifestyle um, medicine, lifestyle psychiatry is really a viable plan, especially for our chronic population. But me saying this, I do appreciate how many of our patients live in food deserts and have food insecurity and have, you know, aren't able to live in environments where they can practice exercising and they can't do these, you know, these, these things that have shown to be improvement. And I think that, it, that it's all the more reason of if we're, if we're really going to try to work on and correcting a lot of these challenges is that we are within a, you know the public health of substance use, that we have to start addressing some of these as well. That's so important. How do you, so for some of our patients who are in a little bit more stable environment, how do you approach lifestyle medicine to them? Because I do have some patients who are stable at least in a stable environment. But when you try to bring up like, well, let's try and improve your sleep or let's talk about your nutrition, it, you just kind of get, it just falls flat. So again, you know, you brought up the motivational interviewing, but obviously it's probably me and my approach, but it seems like it's a hard sell. It is a hard sell. So, you know, all of us kind of are, we all went to medical school about the same time. Um, and in our era of medical school, and I, it's still kind of current now, we talked about this biopsychosocial model of how we think about disease. And individuals um, in Australia and New Zealand are really where, you know, are the leaders within the lifestyle movement. And they've really introduced this idea of expanding the biopsychosocial model to be a biopsychosocial lifestyle model. And so then that becomes part of our conceptualization. And so what might this look like for a patient is, you know, it's easy for us to talk about, okay, uh, Mr. X, you know, tell me about your relationship with alcohol. And we find out the relationship with alcohol. And then we say, well, tell me, do you have any relationships with other substances? And we're very good about that. But if we, if they are in the right frame of mind, we can also then say, well, tell me about your relationship with food. What do you consume? What is, what is your t typical dietary patterns? Tell me about your relationship with sleep. Are you needing the alcohol to fall asleep? Are there days that you can have sleep without using the alcohol? Tell me your relationship with exercise. Is there something in the past that you used to do? Or have you never been, you know, and we can still, you know, once we kind of go through that initial process, we can talk about, you know, their lifestyle you know, assess for their lifestyle. And then we can use motivational interview. And, and, you know, many times we, we hear, how many times do we hear people say, I'm so sick and tired of being sick and tired, right? I'm so sick of this. And, yes. and that for me is like the golden question, the golden comment. Then it's like, beautiful. What do you want to do differently? Motiv that's my motivational interview intervention right there. I you love know? that. Yeah. It's just bringing that into just that making it that normative doctor patient discussion is just yeah we we're talking to you about your your normal health questions and these are just part of the standard normal things that we would discuss and but for some reason it still feels like to them it's an invasion of their privacy and i think that's the wall we're trying to break down right. doesn't it feel like that but i mean i i would ask you know all of us we we've been doing addiction work for 15, 20 years now. I mean, when we were med students, 
wasn't talking about substance use kind of like we thought, oh, this is something taboo. It's like, we're going yeah. to ask how much alcohol they've drank. And and what were you, how, what, what do you prefer to drink and how much, how many days? <laughs> Yeah. Right. And, and when and, do you drink? Are you drinking in the morning? <laughs> right. But after doing that, oh, after a while, it becomes routine, you know, and Dr. Cook, I, I've always loved when you, you know, you used to work there at, you know, I can I call it uni, even though it's now HMHI <laughs> and, and you worked with our, our fellows there. You were, you were one of the biggest advocates about also taking the sexual history because of how many people are involved with trafficking in order to have that. Well, we get, we get very comfortable asking those questions because it's in a conjunction of if you use substances, how do you pay for your substances? And there's such a high degree of trafficking that comes from that. Well, why can't we then just kind of extend that same line of questioning to then also talk about some of these lifestyle areas? Yeah. You know what I've started to do to hold myself accountable is you know, psychiatric review of systems, we like to touch base on that, obviously, in a history, in a, an initial visit. And then even in follow up visits, especially in the outpatient setting, you're always asking about depression, symptoms, anxiety, <clears throat> you know, suicidality. I've made a, a kind of an amalgamated review of systems template that I just put into every note. And it has psychiatric review of systems and substance use review of systems like are you having urges? Are you using any negative consequences? And then I've added a combination of the lifestyle medicine uh, platforms. So I ask about movement, sleep, nutrition, and connection. Those yeah. are the four I ask about. And it's become really fun, actually, because my patients, they kind of, they get ready for it, you know, like, are you going to ask me? Are you going to ask me how many vegetables I eat? And it's, And they're beginning to expect it from me. And it's amazing, like you never know the answer to questions you don't ask. And often it's just the elephant in the room for people. I mean, obviously, if they're using fentanyl, you don't want them to die. You're, you're going to focus on that as the priority. But a lot of times when it comes to really quality of life, and you're talking, Steve, about neuroinflammation, about all these other things that actually could lead to you know, people getting better through the pathways that we're just beginning to understand, we're... We're, we've been neglecting it and I'm guilty of it. So it's great to talk to you about this. And I feel even more motivated now to just follow up on this and to make it part of, of my practice. No, I agree, Paula. I, I haven't been as good because I've always asked about sleep, like appetite, energy level. I've had the, a similar template, but I haven't asked about the nutrition. And that's why I'm like, oh, I've got to do the same. Yeah, getting your vegetable intake count. we got to get that <laughs> <laughs> we need the pictograph maybe like yeah. circle circle which ones you ate <laughs> that's a good idea and in in some of this so like a, a colleague of mine is dr sam men menger who is you know kind of leading the spear in, in australia you know he has as part of like his intake when people are in the waiting room that they have like a lot of those same type of lifestyle questions that people can just kind of fill in the waiting room while they're waiting to be seen. Right. And, and, you know, and they know that they're going to have it when they come in and then it, it has a chance that you can just review that. And I, I like that option as well. Yeah. That's a great option. Oh, great. Well, what else, what have we not talked about? Um, Steve, in terms of this topic of strengthening neuroplasticity and coming at from a framework of lifestyle psychiatry and medicine, I, I think when you look at um, when you look at the studies of how effective are our medications, and so apart from buprenorphine, apart from you know some of these that have these numbers to, to treat at two, our number to treat for antidepressants or antidepressants isn't great the number to treat with using a healthy lifestyle diet is four. And, and, and so if we are really trying to be providers and, and trying to understand what is really going to help patients long-term, shouldn't we as providers know more about all of these options and, and have ownership of the science versus just kind of letting the fads that the people find on the internet be the, the, the dictators of this. And, and I, I think that really when we, as you know, if we're going to try to make 
health, our passion, this becomes a great modality that is probably more exciting because we can actually see see more long-term improvement when we're, we're helping people make these lifestyle changes than just saying, don't do this, 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 and come back and see me in three months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us, Steve. That's great. It's, it was a wonderful topic. I feel inspired and I learned, certainly learned a lot. And we'll put the resources on uh, Darlene. Well, when I say we, Darlene does all this work. She'll put resources on the show notes and her website. <laughs> she does the lion's well, share. Well, thank you again for yeah. this opportunity. It's it's a pleasure talking with you guys. It was nice hanging out with you guys at CSAM. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Until next time. Hey, check us out at theaddictionfiles.com or email us at theaddictionfiles at gmail.com. Thank you so much to Ricky Valides for use of his song, Awake. Check him out at rickyvalides.com. purposes only. Hosts and guests are not responsible for any harm caused by information obtained from this source. As each person is unique, you're advised to seek the advice of your own healthcare professional to treat any medical conditions you may be having. Opinions expressed on this show are those of the addiction files and not of our respective employers.